a lot of confidence in that. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. All right, Acts chapter 6. Um, Acts 6, we're going to be starting today in verse 8. We're going to look at 8 through 15. All right, before we get started, though, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come to you this morning, grateful that we can meet, grateful for our fellow believers in Christ, but grateful above all things for Christ Himself. Lord, we ask you this morning to give us of your Spirit, that we might praise Him, that we might worship Him, and that we might adore you for giving Him. Lord, in order to do this, we know you need to give us of your Spirit, so we ask you humbly this morning to enable us to do this. And also, Lord, we ask your comfort on all those that are suffering, persecuted, or troubled. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. We, last week we read about the naming of the deacons. And one of the first things I want to point out to y'all is you don't read a single word about Stephen doing any deacon work, do you? Now, I know he did. He was involved in the handing out of the bread. But what you do read is about Stephen doing the most important work. Let's read it. Verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. They set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth, ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place, and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. I find this to be absolutely fascinating personally. Here's Stephen, and Stephen is preaching, and he's teaching, and what happens to him? Exactly what happened to Christ. I mean, literally, they accuse him of the same things, don't they? And what did Jesus Christ say? He said, if you're my disciples, the world's going to treat you like they treated me. Why would they treat you any better, right? Why is Stephen treated so bad? Because he preached so boldly, right? What could Stephen have done to immediately cease the persecution? Shut Just shut up. He could have just, when he said his doctrine and somebody disagreed, he could have said, well, okay, I guess as long as we can all get along. He didn't do that. And you know, we're not called to do that. You've got to beware of, it's called ecumenicalism, and it's nothing new. It's been going on forever, but it's got this new terms come along in the last hundred years or so. And what it is, is it's constantly reappearing. And it's an effort to get all professing Christians to say, look, we're all the same. We've got differences, and yet we're all the same. Not according to the Bible. According to the Bible, ecumenicalism is of the devil. For Think about the persecution that arises over Jesus Christ. What could Jesus Christ have done when they were persecuting him in the temple? He could have made the persecution stop, couldn't he? Yeah. All he would have had to say is, okay, you've got your way of viewing the Old Testament. I've got mine. They're both correct. He wouldn't do that, would he? You know, you see men stand up, women too, for the word of God all throughout history and what happens to them? They face persecution. Now, Stephen is the first martyr after Christ. Martyr, the Greek word, means witness. But look what it's come to mean to us. We, we say martyr. We're talking about somebody that died for what they uh, believed, didn't it? But Stephen's name, Stephanus, means a victor's crown. You know when you watch those old Greek and Roman movies and they have their sport and, and Olympiads and all that? When the winner wins, they put that wreath on his head. That's a Stephanos. It's a victor's crown, right? Y'all turn to Revelation 2 before we get going. <clears throat> Lord willing, we're going to um, spend some time in Revelation at Genus and, um, soon. And lots of times I put it off because sometimes you've you got to have you know, good footing in the Bible to kind of get into it, but it's not a book that we ought to avoid. Now, I want to show y'all how it's become such. When people think Revelation today, you know what they immediately think? Uh-oh, that's that harsh stuff that lays ahead. 
But the book of Revelation was written for the comfort of the saints. Guess what the Puritans all agreed was the most encouraging book in the Bible? Revelation. Does that sound like today? No, today it's fear. Why? Because futurism, that new thing that's come out in the last 200 years, has taken Revelation and put it all for some seven-year end-time thing. And yet what did John say when he wrote it? These things are about to come to pass. And it's written for the comfort of the saints. Now when you read it that way, you'll find comfort in every single chapter. Because what do you find? Christ wins. No matter what the world throws at us, Christ wins. Well, if Christ wins, that means if we're in Christ, we win. Don't, yeah. Right? Now watch what happens here in verse uh, 10. 2.10. He says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Now, is there going to be suffering? Amen. Look, even if you're not persecuted, the Christian life is a life of suffering in this world. To begin with, we're supposed to suffer uh, just denying ourselves certain things, aren't we? Look, I'd like to eat all I wanted to eat. Now, I can't say the main reason I don't do it is God. And I'm sad to say that's not the first reason. The first reason is I know it'll kill me, right? But... After I think about that, when I really think, I know that the Lord told me to be moderate in all things, didn't He? To exhibit self-control. So we're called to do that, aren't we? We're called to, to do lots of things that aren't what the world would tell us to do. That's the beginning of suffering. But He says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. Now, in the book of Revelation, when you come to numbers, you've got to decide, is this a literal number or is this figurative? And if it's figurative, which ones are literal? If I'm going to take them literally, which ones do I take figuratively? You can't mix and match. You've got to make that choice when you begin. Now, the easiest way to make that choice is to say, does Jesus Christ have uh, seven eyes? Are there seven Holy Spirits? No. Then the numbers are symbolic, aren't they? But ten is the number for just ordinal perfection in the Bible. Ten speaks of, when I say ordinal perfection, I just mean worldly completeness. In other words, we, we count to ten, and then what do we do? We start over. And that's how we do. That's why you read lots of times about ten nations and ten this and ten. It's just talking about a, a complete cycle. It's not the completion that we find in the number seven. That's godly perfection. Much different than just completion. Okay? That's, you, and I'll give you an example. We're told that the Jews murmured against God ten times in the wilderness. Does that mean literally ten times? No, it means they just kept doing it in cycles over and over. Okay, now he says, You shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That's the Stephanos. Who's the first person that got one? Stephen. After Christ, it's Stephen. Stephen gets the victor's crown. It's a different crown. Christ did get the victor's crown, but Christ also got another crown. Christ got the crown of a king. Now, the Stephanos is not the crown of a king. It's the crown of someone who's won a victory in, in, in a sporting game, basically. So, he's telling Stephen here and all of us, be faithful unto death, and what happens? You'll be rewarded. I mean, isn't that what every athlete does when he's training? Mm -hmm. Is training fun? It's a form of physical suffering, isn't it? And yet, why do they all do it? Because they're, good. Because they're yeah. Hey, y'all know there's a big thing going on right now. There's some, uh, there's some little skinny guy that's uh, going to fight Mike Tyson. Y'all yeah. seen this? This little skinny guy fights, and he can fight. He picks out these guys, and he, he has fights against them, and he can fight. Huh? He's a lot younger, too. He's a lot younger, but he's now picked out Mike Tyson, who's in 56 or so, I think. Okay? But unless Tyson throws it, he's going to kill him. He's just going to kill him. If he hits him one time, at a, even at age 56, he's going to kill him. Have you all seen a video of him hitting the bag lately? Yes. He'll kill him, won't he? I suspect that there's a fix in because Mike needs the money and the other guy's on the up and coming. And it would do the, the one guy no good to lose. It ruins his career. Whereas if he wins, there's a bunch more money in promotion. So I suspect Mike's probably going to take a dive or at least keep it even throughout. But... If he wanted to, what would happen? He'd kill him. What has Mike been doing to prepare? He's been training. He's been putting out these videos. Have y'all watched the stuff he's doing? I mean, he's amazing, but have you watched what he's putting himself through? 
It's grueling, isn't it? Y'all ever picked up one of those medicine balls? They are heavy. And what's he doing with it? He's spinning this way and letting a guy hit him in the stomach. And he spins this way and he hits him in the stomach. Then he holds it up over his head and the guy hits him in the stomach. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that for nothing, would y'all? Because I don't want the victor's crown he wants. Right? A person who's not a Christian is not going to suffer for the name of Christ. They're not going to. Why? Because when the rubber meets the asphalt, they'll stop. But what did Stephen do? Stephen held fast. Stephen got the victor's crown. We're probably not going to get to his preaching today, but we're going to get to the core of it. And what we find is even when they hated him and want to kill him, what did he do? He kept on. He held to the course. Okay? So this is Stephen. Now, again, we read nothing of his work as a deacon, but boy, we sure see his work as an evangelist. He preaches the longest sermon in the New Testament. All of chapter 7 is, is a sermon of Stephen. And what does he do? He does just what Paul did, what Peter, what Christ did. He goes back to the Old Testament and he expounds it. And what does he tell them about the Old Testament? It's pointing at Christ. They had the promise of the land, and because of their unbelief, they never received the promises. And he said, and you Jews today are repeating the exact same thing. All this is being laid in front of you, and you're just doing exactly what the Jews did in the wilderness. He ends by calling them, you stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart. He made them so mad, they come running on him, grabbed him, and stoned him, didn't he? And what did he say as one of his last words? Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Now, is that natural? No. 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 This is a man that was being moved by the Spirit. Okay? All right. <clears throat> it's ironic to me also, before we get into the details, y'all flip back over to Acts. Isn't it ironic that Stephen, the first martyr, is used by Luke as a, how would I say, as a forerunner for Saul? Because through Stephen, Saul's going to enter into the picture, isn't he? And y'all know who's going to take up the ministry of Stephen and run with it? Saul. Saul. Stephen is preaching, starts by preaching to the Grecian Jews at a synagogue who, by all accounts and purposes, Paul was probably a member of because it's, from, it's P Paul's people here. Now, whether Paul was a member of the synagogue or not, we can't be sure. But one thing we can be sure of, he was there, wasn't he? When they stone Stephen, who holds their coats? Saul. So as he's traveling on the road to Damascus, has he heard Stephen's preaching? Has he rejected it? But y'all know he said he did it uh, sincerely. He said God didn't hold it to his account because he did it ignorantly. He honestly thought he was in the right and stood against Stephen. What's the opposite of that? It's the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, which is what? To know the truth, to have the truth clearly made known unto you, and to know it's the truth, and yet to say, uh-uh, forget it. Remember when they saw Jesus perform miracles? They knew that was the power of God. Even Nicodemus said, we Pharisees know you come from God. And yet what did they call him that day? They publicly called him the devil. Right? That's the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, to deny the truth that has been revealed to you. And can a person that does that be saved? How are you going to be saved if you deny the message about the person who saves you? You're not. Okay? Very simply, you're not. All right, so let's begin with this. A description of Stephen I want to start with. Number one, Stephen, it says, <coughs> let's put him up here on the board. We read that Stephen was full of faith. Okay? Now, what in the world does that mean? Yeah. What would you say, Gina? Mature. Mature. What would you say, Manny? Okay, y'all both got it. Both are true. Can you be saved without faith? No. No. Every single saved person has faith. It is a gift God gave them, the means through which He saved them. He opens our ears and makes it possible for us to hear the truth and to believe. Every saved person has faith. If you don't have faith, you're not saved. Even if your faith is as a grain of mustard seed. But, Gina said it also means he was mature. 
He didn't have faith like a grain of mustard seed, did he? His faith had grown. Now, there's two ways we want to look at faith here, okay? We're going to do A and B. And we really can do this with, the, with faith and with the Spirit. Okay, let's start off by saying this. Every regenerate Christian has faith, but there are degrees of the faith that they have. Right? Okay, let's look at a couple examples. Y'all go to Romans 4. Look, context is always the most important thing when we're studying our Bible. So when we run into things that are confusing or into things that seem to contradict, always look at the context. For instance, if you and I are ever told to, um, to build our faith, to increase our faith, or to grow in faith, that indicates that you and I play a role in it, doesn't it? So then you and I have a part. What would be the beginning way of us doing anything there? The Word of God. To build my faith, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So what's going to build my faith? <laughs> Prayerful study of the Word of God, right? But then we're also going to see that there is the spiritual gift of faith, and it's something different. It's not that gift of faith that's given to all saved people. It's that special spiritual gift which is only given to some. And it's not given in a... Um, how would I say, a static manner. In other words, it's not like God said, okay, this one's got faith, and boom, they've got this great faith. It's given as needed. For instance, what made Stephen so brave? Holy the Holy Spirit. And what did the Holy Spirit give him? Courage, Courage and faith. He, because of what he believed so strongly at that moment, he stood, didn't he? You know, Paul's going to tell us, and we'll go there in a minute, but Paul says, look, to some's given the gift of miracles. Right? To some's given the gift of prophecy. He said, to some, the gift of faith. Well, if that faith is saving faith, then there's people that have all the gifts and don't have faith. You see how the context tells us that it's a different way faith is being used, right? So first off, let's look at the degrees of what I would just call um, saving faith. Okay, let's call it that. Saving faith. Now there are degrees of saving faith. In Romans 4, 19, we're talking about Abraham. And it says, verse 19, Paul says, being not weak in the faith. Now, weak in the faith doesn't mean no faith. It means weak faith, doesn't it? Is weak faith still faith? Yes. Yes. Thank God it is. If weak faith wasn't faith, when I read about Stephen, I, w I couldn't even be saved. Because my weak faith, if it's not still faith, I'm lost because I don't have the faith of Stephen. But I do have weak faith. And you know what? My weak faith still saves. It's God who gives even that weak faith, that grain of mustard seed. All right. He says now, being not weak in the faith, Abraham, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. Now, can you say Abraham was strong in faith to the same degree in Genesis uh, 15 as he was in Genesis 22? Then what happened to him? He grew. he grew. How did he grow? By faith. By faith. But how does faith grow? By hearing the Word of God. Did he have the written Word of God? No. But did he have God speaking to him? Yeah. Did he have God acting in his life? Yeah. What did Abraham learn about God? Trust if God said it, that's it. Now, early on, God made him a promise, and it didn't immediately come to pass. And in Genesis 15, God starts talking about his reward. Y'all remember? And he said, well, Lord, hold on. I mean, what do you give to the man that's got everything? Abraham was the richest man on earth, probably. He was certainly loaded, wasn't he? What do you give the guy that's got everything? He, you know, I'm, I'm thankful. I, uh, he, every year uh, when Christmas rolls around, I'm thankful the less and less I have to participate in Christmas because I never know what to get somebody. I would just whole rather nobody gets eaten by anything and we hug and have some eggnog, okay? Because that whole process is hard, isn't it? But when a man's got everything, the only thing you could give him would be something that he could never buy for himself. What's the one thing Abraham could not get? A child. And God promised him a child, didn't he? And Abraham said, you've promised me a child, but... 
I don't see him. If I die today, my servant's my heir. And God said, no, I told you I was going to give you a child. I'll give you a child. And Abraham's like, when? See, his faith, he had faith. He believed God. He was still dwelling in the land. If he had not believed God at all and had given up, he'd have gone back home. He's not. He's living as a pilgrim in the land. But what's his faith doing? It's wavering. So what does God do? God gives him an increase. How? He speaks to him. God stooped so low that day that God actually took an oath. Isn't that something? Can you imagine God who cannot lie, swearing? God said, I swear by my own name. How did he do it? He walked through the parts of those animals. God took a covenant like men take covenants. Who in the world would want God to have to take a covenant? Did God do it for God's reputation? No. He did it for Abraham's benefit. And it says that Abraham, before he even took that covenant, God reaffirmed the promise, and it says Abraham believed God. Now, was Abraham's faith nonstop persistent? Nope. What's he doing in the next chapter? He sleeps with Hagar. He thinks that the means of providing the, the seed is going to be through his own works and manipulations with his wife. What did God tell him? Yeah. That ain't how it's going to happen. Now, God said, I'm going to give you that child. It's going to be the child of promise. You can in no way produce it. Now, that does not mean that Abraham was not the father of Isaac. It means that unless God opened Sarah's womb, Abraham's seed never get in there. So what's the miraculous thing that happened? God opened her womb. You know who Sarah is a picture of in Scripture, don't you? Yes. Us, the church. Sarah could in no wise conceive a child on her own, could she? Me and you can do nothing without God. And what's the first thing God does? He opens our spiritual womb. He regenerates us. He gives us life. He circumcises our ear, circumcises our heart. And what does that allow to happen? The seed of His Word comes in. Now that's how salvation starts. So, does your salvation start with you believing? No. Your believing is one of the first acts of, of a saved man. You didn't believe to get saved. You believe because God has regenerated you. And the scripture is very clear on this. People don't like to hear this because they want to believe that every human being can decide to be saved. Tell Esau that. Esau sought it with tears. Did he get saved? No. Okay, so we've got this full of faith. I want to read you all something real quick, if you don't mind, because I liked it so much I want to share it with you. It's from the Westminster Confession. That's the old, you know, in the Reformation when they had... Um, uh, all the Protestant denominations came out of Catholicism. Each one of them felt, felt compelled to write a confession. In other words, they wrote a, a list of what we believe, the foundation, the principles. And it was good. People needed to know what they believed. And they're all really similar. No matter what man did it, two men on two different continents wrote basically the same thing because it was the same Spirit of God moving them to do this. But, and I don't mean they were under inspiration like the writers. I just mean it was the same God that revealed the same truth of the Scripture to them, right? But this is what the Westminster Confession says concerning faith. True believers may have the assurance of their salvation diverse ways shaken. A true believer can have our faith shaken, can't we? He said, it can be diminished and intermitted as by negligence in the preserving of it. In other words, you and I can neglect it, and what happens? Our faith weakens. Y'all know good and well when we turn away from God in prayer and in study of the Word, what happens to us? We get weaker, just like eating. If you don't eat, what happens? You get weaker. Hey, but when you eat a good, steady, healthy diet, you get stronger, don't you? He said, or, he said, by the negligence of preserving it, or by falling into some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit. Every saved person can fall into some kind of sin which itself causes us to doubt. Would a saved person do this? Do I really love God? And it grieves us, doesn't it? It says, but, by, uh, but it grieves the Spirit by some sudden or vehement temptation, by God's withdrawing the light of His countenance, and suffering even such as fear Him to walk in darkness and to have no light. There are times when you and I choose a path and God lets us go. He says, take it. We do this with our kids, don't we? I mean, really. 
he, I've told you all the story over and over. I, I had an uncle that really was kind of like a dad to me. And I was a young teenager and starting to learn things, you know, boys need to know when we're working on a car. And I had the ratchet on the water pump. And I'm doing this, and there's the radiator right there. And I got the ratchet like this, right? And my uncle said, hey, stop there, boy. I said, why? He said, that ratchet slips on there. Look at that radiator. And you know what I told him? I said, look here, old man, I got this. <laughs> Just about the time I said that, the ratchet slipped. And you know what happened? Yes. Right into the radiator. It sliced my knuckles wide open. He was standing there with his coffee, and he went, <laughs> turned around, walked off laughing. You say, that's cruel. I've never done it since. Not once have I done that again. Every time I get anywhere near a radiator, the first thing I think is all efforts going that way, right? Sometimes you allow your children to do this, don't you? God will allow us to go down these paths for our own good. It doesn't mean that God sent us down. It means we made a choice and God let us have our choice. He says this, though. Um, he, he'll suffer such as them to walk in darkness and to have no light, yet are they never so utterly destitute of that seed of God and that life of faith, that the love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and consciousness of duty, out of which the operation of the Spirit, the assurance may in due time be revived, and by the which in the meantime they are supported from utter despair." In other words, a person who's saved can go down a trail, can take up a, 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 a way in which they become so fallen in their fate, so weak that they think they're not even saved, but will God ever let them go? No. That seed of faith will never fail. At some point, what's going to happen? God's going to bring you back. But during that time, how do you feel? Awful. You feel like you lost, don't you? You know, after you've gone through it several times, you might not feel each time like you're lost, but you feel like, how could God have anything to do with me? This is all the learning process. You know, kids do this. He, we, I got two kids, and both of them are major league powders. I mean, they're professional powders. You tell them something, and here comes the pouting. And Sienna's old enough now that I'll tell her now, you're pouting. Do you realize the privilege that you have here? You realize how many people wish that they had this or that? or And it's, what's pouting do? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, what does pouting accomplish? Nothing. But you know how many times me and you are guilty of spiritual pouting? Mm -hmm. I have to remind myself, what I see Sienna doing physically, lots of times I do spiritually. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that's a bad thing. So all I'm trying to show y'all is that this first faith that Stephen had, Stephen had was the faith that saves, right? And because of his own action, what was the level of his saving faith? It was strong that day. I don't know what it was like a week before. I assume it had probably been getting stronger and stronger rapidly through the study of the Scriptures. But had he not been killed and lived another 20 years, there would probably have been some days or weeks or even months where his faith kind of went the other way, wouldn't it? It's because it's based upon our taking in of God's promises. Faith always comes by people making a promise and keeping the promise. Why do you have faith in someone? Because they keep their word. So the more you interact with God, what happens? Your faith is built because God always keeps His word. As, as the writer of Hebrews said, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What's causing me to hope for heaven? Faith. And he said it's also the evidence of things not seen. That does not mean it's evidence to the outside world. They don't believe anyway. In other words, what is my evidence that those things exist? Faith, which has showed me all the things he's already done. Faith makes our hope. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is kind of a, you know, one of the things we want to talk about with Stephen, but there's another degree of his faith, and it's that spiritual gift of faith. Right? For instance, do you remember when Jesus told them uh, in the boat when they thought they were dying? He said, oh, ye of little faith. Mm -hmm. But little faith's faith, isn't it? Mm -hmm. okay? We read of some people that were strong in faith, and in this particular case, Stephen is strong in faith. But go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Thank you. 
In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's talking about gifts. And in verse 4, he says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. In other words, each Christian doesn't have the same gifts. Now, there were those visible gifts in that day that literally were visible confirmation, sign gifts, we call them, right? Me and you don't have sign gifts today. I know people claim they do, but we don't need sign gifts. Why do we not need sign gifts? Because faith cometh by hearing. We got the Word of God, okay? But in this particular time, I'm not saying there's not gifts today. There are gifts. God puts all the members in the body as it hath pleased Him. And He compares the church to a human body. What did God decide the eye was going to do? See. See. Now, can you do anything about that? No. Can you imagine the ear getting mad at the eye and leaving the body because it didn't see? God determined the ear was going to hear, didn't it? And what about the tongue? The tongue gets to speak. You know, people say, yeah, but I'm just a foot. Well, how you foot, how's the tongue going to get around without the foot? God puts us all together. The whole body in each individual little case. I like to think of the whole body and think of all the, the organs in a body. Let's start the systems, entire systems, right? And they're made up of organs, aren't they? And the organs are made up of, of tissue, and the tissue is made up of cells, and you know, each one's doing what God designed. Mm -hmm. Think of all the little groups and all the churches. This is how God does it. So he's using that analogy to say, whatever gift God's given you, don't worry about the other gifts. Do what God's given you to do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Look, I'm not a person that, can y'all imagine who in here would like me to crack your neck? Yeah. You don't want me cracking your neck? No. Oh, I'd love to work on your upper, what's that, what's the one up there, Chris, right by the brain? Oxypus. Yeah, let me get a hold of that one, right? Yeah. You don't want me fooling with that. <laughs> Have y'all ever had Chris crack your neck? Yes. I'm certain he was going to break my neck at first, <laughs> but y'all know what? The headaches went away, and yeah. hey, but the whole point being is, you don't want me working on your neck because I'm not qualified. Knows Chris knows what he's doing. Better than that, I've been to several chiropractors. I don't have any of them crack me like Chris. He, I told it, I said it one time, and then I had to step back because Chris started yeah. picking on me. But I said, no, I, I want a guy to manhandle me. And then I said, no, wait, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> you know. But the point being is, some of them don't get the job done. He, I don't know much about it, but I would have to say, Dina, you know a lot about. It. Wouldn't you have to say that honestly, naturally, Chris has just been gifted with that? Yes. He found the right thing. He's gifted with it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would y'all like Chris to wire your house? No. no. Well, uh, come on. Why not? Computer work. Okay. <laughs> hey, but the whole point being is, look, we all know how to do different things. We all can do different things. You know what a smart man does? What he can. What he can. You know what a smart man... Huh? Find somebody smarter. But yeah, it's, and it's not intelligence. It's you find somebody that that's what they do. Well, in the church, most problems seem to come from somebody trying to do that, which they're really not called to do. I mean, it happens all the time, and we're going to see it in the church here in Acts. We're going to see it. But we've just got to be content, don't we? Now, here's Stephen. Stephen's not mad he's not an apostle. And yet God's using him almost as greatly as an apostle, isn't he? Where did he start? serving tables. Did you hear him grumbling or moaning? No. no. So Paul's talking about these gifts. There are diversities of gifts, verse 4, but the same Spirit. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit that gives the gifts. He said there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There's different, there's different classes of uh, organization and different classes of, of, I won't use the word ruling, but, you know, controlling certain things and, and being in charge of this or that. Hey, y'all know churches are famous for committees. Yeah. If you ever, you know, especially if you've been near a big church, you're going to do something, you get a committee together. He, I remember me and Wayne had an uh, old preacher years ago, and he said, look, if something needs doing, just do it. And I said, what do you mean? He said, this bunch will talk about it forever. <laughs> he said, just do it. Now, that, that's, you know, you can get lost in all of that, can't you? I mean, do you really need a committee to decide if the grass needs cutting? Mm -hmm. No. But he says there's different administrations. Verse 6, there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. God knows what we need. God knows individually what we need, and God knows what the group needs. And what does He do? He brings it together. 
And now he says, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Right? He says to another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Now what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? No. Some, some people know knowledge. Okay? My granny had wisdom. Knowledge is, is having the information and understanding it. Wisdom is knowing how to use it and apply it. Al. Not everybody. Mr. Al had wisdom, yeah. Not everybody. And I'm not saying all of these are spiritual gifts. I'm just telling y'all, look, we are all made by God, and God made each one of us as He so desires. I know science today says no. You're the result of your parents' DNA. And well, who made the DNA? God. Who makes it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a great passage... Um, y'all hold y'all's hands there and go to Exodus 4. I've got to preach a, a funeral this week. And in talking, I, I've told y'all about Miss Marilyn and her son. In talking with Miss Marilyn, um, this passage keeps coming out over and over to me. God calls Moses <clears throat> and uh, wants Moses to go speak for him. And y'all remember what Moses said? Moses said in verse 10, Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. So what's Moses saying? I don't have what, yeah. I, he, so, lots of people say out of speech impediment. I don't know, but here's what he's saying. I don't have what it takes. Right? Lord, you don't understand. I've got this, this, and this going against me. Now, where'd he go wrong? Lord, you don't understand. Because the Lord answers, verse 11, the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? What's the answer? God. God. Or who maketh the dumb? What's the answer? God. God. Or the deaf? God. God. Or the seen? God. He said, Or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Mm -hmm. Now, you know what I could add to that? Of the physically disabled? I could add to that of those that uh, autism. You could say, yeah, but it's the vaccines causing it, folks. If God didn't allow it to be, it wouldn't be. God is in charge. And someone would say, well, what about like uh, Down syndrome, right? One of the things I've noticed about Down syndrome is they are always the sweetest people you will ever meet in this world. Every time. Every time they're that way. I only met uh, Miss Marilyn's son maybe a oh, half dozen times. And every time I met him, it come across to me that this kid's got the sweetest disposition. Mm -hmm. Now, he is with the Lord today. And somebody said, how do you know? Because Jesus Christ died for the sin of Adam. Right? How many times is, is at the judgment seat, Rizzo was his nickname, how many times will Rizzo have to answer for his adultery? His lying, his stealing, his his rebelling against the Lord. I'm not saying he's not a sinner. He's got the sin of Adam. But did he go out and get involved in all the things I've been involved in my life? What a wonderful thing to be able to say at the judgment seat, isn't it? If God makes people as they are, then who gave Miss Marilyn the incredible privilege of raising this child? God. It's not a curse. People say, oh, what did she do? No, baloney. It's a privilege, and God gave it to her, okay? Just like God gives that, God gives spiritual gifts to His people. Now, back over there to 1 Corinthians 12. We need to get to this one spiritual gift in particular. He says again in verse 8 at the end, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Verse 9, to another faith. Now, he said not everybody has the same gifts. To some, to another, faith. Well, if that's saving faith, then what's he saying about all the rest of them? They're all lost. Then this is not saving faith, is it? Well, what is it? This is the spiritual gift of faith, right? It's the thing God gave Abraham. When he told Abraham, 86 years old, you're going to have a kid. And what did Abraham do? He believed him. Is that normal? Is it natural? Was Abraham's wife ever able to have children? <laughs> Only when God stepped in. You see, that's the supernatural gift of faith. And we see that throughout church history. Men need it and God gives it to them. Well, who's one of them? Stephen. Stephen was full both of saving faith <clears throat> and of the gift of faith. Can y'all think of anyone else that would exhibit the gift of faith? How about Peter on the day of Pentecost? 
That started, they started, they, what was going on was miraculous. And he said, what? No, this isn't anybody drunk. This is what the Word of God said. What did Peter do uh, seven weeks before? Denied. Denied the Lord three times. Mm -hmm. Did Peter then go on to make more errors later after Pentecost? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul had to correct him. What's that tell you about the gift of faith? It's not a once and for all thing. When needed, God did it. Look, you and I have got to learn to trust the Lord. And when we say trust the Lord, what do we mean? We mean trust the Holy Spirit to give us what we need in this life to serve the Lord. That's what we've got to do. And whatever's needed, He'll give us, won't He? So that's how He had these gifts of faith. Stephen had both, okay? And, um, you know, we're built up and edified in one sense by, by the one faith, but the other faith does something else. As God gives the gift of this faith, it itself is edifying and building our basic faith, isn't it? As we see God work and learn we can depend on Him, what happens? That other faith grows. Okay, so those are the two, two of the faiths. All right, let's do one more. Power. Go back over there to Acts 6. <clears throat> Acts 6, 8 says this of Stephen. And Stephen, full of faith and power. Now, I love the Greek word that we get power from. It's where we get dynamite from. Power, explosive power, right? Power. He had power in the visible signs to do the wonders and miracles. We know he did that because it says he did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now that he did by the power of God, didn't he? Mm -hmm. But he had an even better power than that. Did anybody get saved by the scene of the miracles? Do y'all realize everybody in this audience saw the miracles, and what did the majority of them do? Stoned him. Do you see why those miracles don't save, do they? Faith doesn't come by seeing. It comes by hearing. It's, it's one of the sure signs of election, absolutely for sure, that people could see the miraculous things they saw and not believe. Yeah. You want to talk about a testimony to the obstinate nature of a sinner? That's us will not be persuaded, will we? You know what the root meaning of the word faith is? Persuaded. Persuaded. He, like that same uncle I had <clears throat> had a stick in his truck I, for whatever reason. You know, old timers always had him one. And he called that his persuader. <laughs> you know what that means. You know, if he's got to persuade somebody, right? But faith is to be fully persuaded. Persuaded by who? God. Now, how does God persuade us? By His Word. I mean, what makes you think there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth? God said so. Well, what makes you believe Him? Because I see the thousand other promises He's made, and every single one of them has happened just like He said. Furthermore, I see the heaven and the earth which are now. And how did this one come into existence? God said so. God said, let there be, and there was. Well, then what would make me think in the future? He can't say, let there be, and there will be. Of course there will. <clears throat> All right, so he had this power. Now, um, power in the Word is what we really want to get to. He had power in his preaching. You know, if you read the diary of George Whitfield, he kept diaries, and I'm so thankful for him. <clears throat> he was very aware of this as he would preach. Sometimes he would say that the preaching just fell on naught. He said, he just knew nothing. But he said sometimes he was preaching and he would put it, he would always say it this way, and the Spirit came. And he knew that he was being in the preaching. He knew that the Spirit was leading him. He could feel it and he could see it. And what would be the result? Saving. Saving. You'd see power. That's the power that he's talking about. And you know, when the apostles went out, power went with the preaching, didn't it? Uh, Jonathan Edwards is another. I told you all about him preaching sinners in the hands of an angry God. And the congregation was lifting their feet up to get it out of the fire of hell. Now, that's not just a bunch of superstitious people. That's people that are being persuaded by powerful preaching, isn't it? And, you know, today we don't see much powerful preaching. There, there's a lot, but you don't see it a lot. Um, I've experienced very little of it, but I can tell you all that I know this, that at times I know for sure that God is at work in what, in what the verses I'm using. I know that. Other times I know I'm struggling and I'm on my own. 
And when I know that I'm struggling, I'm on my own, I always go back and I find it's the same reason. Because from the get-go, I didn't depend on him. I depended on my preparation or my notes. That goes nowhere. And lots of times that power comes in a way which you're not. He, I had a class prepared this past week. And I knew what, I was, what I'd been doing and what I was going to do. And I got there. Chris come to class. I got there and I saw Chris and I saw the people there. And one person in particular came and I thought, you know what? Away with the notes. We need to do something different. And it was, I was very aware as we were going along that the verses that were coming to my mind were not out of my uh, imagination. It, God's leading you. And you can feel it. You can, Chris, can you not feel it amongst people? Oh, yeah. You can. I've told you all times, sometimes you'll go where there's multiple preaching. And it doesn't mean because sometimes nothing happens. Spurgeon would talk about this, that some days he just felt the, the leadership of the Spirit un, unlike other days. This is what Stephen was under. This is why people get saved. The preacher can't do anything. All the preacher can do is share verses. Now, what happens is... When you go and there's multiple preachers, sometimes a guy will preach. Hey, one time always comes to mind in particular. I sat and listened to this guy preach, and the whole, everything about it was phony. Everything about it was, was an appeal for attention. And everything about it was about, about him, about the presentation. It felt like he was trying to sell me a car. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it just it did nothing. But he used good words and fancy language and his hair. and he, You know what I mean? The next guy got up. He's, he's from DIP. Y'all know what a DIP accent is? Okay. Yeah. yeah, Chris does, I know. People down DIP have a different way of talking. They just really do. I enjoy it. It's like a back bay accent, Gene. It's kind of real similar, right? He got up and butchered the English language. His grammar's horrible. He spit all over, you know, and he just, but he went through this thing, and you know what? There was power in it. Christ was glorified. Your eye was taken off the preacher and your mind's eye was put on Christ. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. The other guy had a much better presentation, but it didn't do anything. Why? The Spirit wasn't behind it. This is, this is a normal, you know, this happens all the time. And in times of great revival, it happens a lot. George Whitfield would preach, and I've told you all this, one of the most amazing things was this. There's no intercoms. There's no anything like that, right? No bullhorn. He would preach and they could hear his voice for up to like a mile. Can you imagine? This is not a fairy tale. I'll tell you all how serious how you can prove this. One of his good friends was Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin was a scientist. And he would listen to Whitfield preach and he would measure and do tests. And he attested one time a mile and three quarters, I think it was, that you could clearly hear his voice. He wasn't screaming. What was happening? The Spirit of God was just delivering it. Why? Because the Word's got to go forth. It's no different than Pentecost. All those people speaking all those different languages, how are they going to understand Peter? They're not. So Peter spoke. He didn't scream. He spoke. And what did the Holy Spirit do? He got it to each person in their language. Benjamin Franklin would take these tests and measure, and yet when he died, Whitfield wrote, it broke his heart, but there was not one single thing in the life or testimony of that man that would make him think he was saved. He wasn't. He was a deist. Benjamin Franklin was a deist, a Mason deist. And so it just goes to show you that even it doesn't matter how powerful the preaching is. If God doesn't open the heart, nothing's going to happen. But when Whitfield did preach, while Franklin's doing his measurements, you know what happened to hundreds and thousands? They got converted. Can Whitfield do that? Y'all know Whitfield was cockeyed? Seriously, they called him Dr. Cockeyes, making fun of him. What is somebody cockeyed? I mean, well, why would God do such a thing? He could have let him have a straight eye. Humble. Why did he let Paul, whatever was wrong with him, humble? I mean, it keeps a person humble, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. we, me and Wayne knew a preacher, and I, I have every reason to believe the man was saved. He would, from time to time, spit his teeth out on the pulpit. Remember that, Wayne? <laughs> he would get so, it, he was so sincere about what he was preaching, he got put, and man, them teeth had come out and hit the pulpit. <laughs> hey, Wayne is my witness. He wouldn't miss a lick. He'd stick them right back in and keep right on going. He, he was very sincere in what he was doing, right? And that happens all the time. I heard a story 
story about a preacher once that was preaching, and lightning storm came up while he was preaching, and lightning, uh, literally in the building, the, the spark hit the microphone he was preaching into. And you know what he did? He kept on preaching. I'm scared to say what I would have done. Wet my <laughs> pants probably, but the whole idea is that the Spirit of God is at work. And what is Stephen doing this day? Stephen is full of power. Does Stephen have any power of his own? <laughs> then what's he full of? He's full of God's power. And if God supplies the power, are things going to happen? You trust God. Happens every time. Okay? All right, let's take a break, and then we'll look at some of these other things it says about him.